from MTN News. This is Face the State. Welcome to Face the State. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jackie Coffin. And I'm Augusta McDonald. From mysterious flying objects to property taxes, it was an eventful week in Helena as the 68th legislative session moves on. One issue we knew lawmakers would take up, voting and election security. A select group of state lawmakers has been taking a deep dive into Montana's election procedures. MTN senior political reporter Jonathan Ambarian has a closer look at what the committee has been covering. At the start of the 68th session, state legislative leaders set up the Joint Select Committee on Election Security and tasked it with answering some of the questions Montana voters have asked about the state's election system. I've been hearing a lot from citizens that are concerned about our elections and our election security. Senator Carl Glim, a Republican from Kyla, chaired the committee, though it was created in the wake of some Montana residents making allegations about election irregularities. Glim said the committee had a different focus. We didn't want to go backward and look backward. What we wanted to focus on was what can we make better in our election system. Over the last month, the committee has heard extensive testimony from local election officials, the Montana Secretary of State's office, and a company that produces Montana's electronic vote tabulators. Democratic Senator Shane Morijo of Missoula said that showed what election officials are already doing well. We learned a lot about processes and systems, and we learned that our, our Montana elections are, are very secure. Glim said he also saw important things come out in the testimony, like the ways voting machines are secured and the value of the state's post-election audits. When you have that tie back and that test, um, that helps to really give you some assurance that those numbers are what they're reporting. This week, the committee will be discussing possible ideas for bills. Glim said one proposal is to set up a new central hub under the Department of Justice, where all reports of election-related issues can be investigated. I think it would give uh, the citizens a feeling of being heard and give us an opportunity to look into those instances and, and come out with some kind of conclusion. Morjo says that's something he's open to, as long as it's not making it harder for people to vote. In a lot of ways, that could be a positive thing because I think it takes pressure off of local officials. Glim says they intend to have any legislation out of the committee introduced within the next week or so, so it can be heard before a deadline early next month. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Thank you, Jonathan. And protests were held around the state over bills impacting Montana's LGBTQ community. From Helena to Billings, members and allies of the LGBTQ community gathered to protest on Saturday following recent bill hearings in the state capitol that could impact the way they express themselves. A few of the bills protesters are urging the legislature to vote down. House Bill 359, which was heard by a legislative committee last Thursday, it would prohibit drag performances at schools and libraries and make it illegal for businesses that host such events from allowing minors. Another bill, HB 361, would prevent schools from disciplining students for referring to their peers by their legal name or sex, regardless of how they identify. Taxpayer-funded facilities should not be um, sponsoring events such as this. We need to be out here. And just because it doesn't affect you doesn't mean that it doesn't affect your neighbor or your sister or your coworker or someone that you know. It is very important to the people of the, this community. The House Local Government Committee heard a bill this week that would return local control to city governments for single-use plastics. As towns around the country deal with growing trash piles and consider earth-friendly solutions, MTN's Diane Parker explains why, when it comes to plastic, Montana Town's hands are tied. When you crack open a bottle of water, well, it may seem pretty convenient, but where it ends up has some of Montana's major cities now standing up to the state legislature asking for local control back to regulate plastics. Single-use plastics are more painful for me to see than probably all the nails on all the chalkboards. In 2021, the Montana legislature passed a bill making local control of plastics regulation impossible. A year later, that has an environmental law firm in Bozeman taking action. And they passed House Bill 407, which is commonly called a ban on bans. It was reactive to some other cities and states across the United States passing bans on plastic bags and imposing taxes and stuff on plastic bags. 
And House Bill 407 essentially banned cities and towns from passing bans. Big Fork Representative Mark Nolan sponsored the bill, which is designed to standardize plastics regulation statewide, but with no regulation in sight, Bozeman City Council, in a recent unanimous vote, is formally nudging the state legislature with a resolution to either regulate plastics or give local control back. I was blown away by what Bozeman City Council did. Now we have a framework to go on, so I'm really grateful, and I hope the other major cities in Montana follow suit. In fact, Katie reached out to the Billing City Council, and now Council Member Danny Shariki is presenting a similar resolution and expects it to hit an agenda in about a month. Just like we say with the states and the federal government, the local governments um, here in, in Montana are the places to try innovation. I think local control is extremely important. I think that that's what our country is all about. I think that's the heart of a lot of the Montana spirit. Do a little bit of research and make a decision for yourself and let's put it, let's put a vote to the citizens of Billings. Until then, Isaac says Bozeman representative Ed Staffman is drafting statewide legislation to repeal House Bill 407, a heated topic as Montana landfills continue to heat. Right now, with the amount of stuff we're putting into our landfill here in Billings, we have about 80 years of room. The reality is that there are kids who are growing up today who are going to have to deal with finding a new way of getting rid of stuff. In Billings, Diane Parker, MT. News. Thank you, Diane. And earlier this month, the Montana Senate voted down a bill that would have revised the state's commercial driver's license laws to comply with new federal requirements. Now, leaders are looking at what the consequences could be if that change isn't made. MTN senior political reporter Jonathan Ambarian is back again with a closer look at this issue. Senate Bill 47 would have made relatively small changes to Montana's laws on commercial driver's licenses. But state administrators say if it fails to pass by the end of the legislative session, it could have far-reaching impacts. The bill, sponsored by Republican Senator Teresa Manzella of Hamilton, would have directed the State Motor Vehicle Division to check whether an applicant seeking their first CDL has completed a federally required entry-level driver training before giving them a test. State leaders say most states have already implemented this change, and if Montana doesn't follow suit, the federal government has threatened they could withhold millions of dollars in highway funding or decertify the state CDL program. If Montana's CDL program is decertified, the MVD would be prohibited from issuing new CDLs, which is approximately 1,200 per year, or renewing or upgrading current CDLs. The Senate rejected SB 47 23 to 27 and voted down an attempt to revive it several days later. Opponents said entry-level training is a big hurdle in cost and in time for would-be commercial drivers, especially in rural Montana, and there's already enough challenges in finding workers. So the threat is that the feds are going to decertify us. Well, the feds threaten to decertify and withhold funding all the time. Supporters said the requirements already exist in federal law, and there are options for addressing the training costs. Great Falls College MSU recently began a CDL training program that works in conjunction with employers. Industry came to us and, and told us um, you know, about this uh, in, incredible need that's out there for commercial drivers uh, and, and asked us to respond to that. While they're certified as an entry-level program, leaders are concerned about the impact on drivers who go through their training if Montana's CDL system is decertified. That's the potential consequence that's out there. Even if you've gone through a program that is ELDT um, certified in the state of Montana, the federal government could still decertify your license. Senate Bill 47 was brought at the request of the Montana Department of Transportation. The Montana Department of Justice, which oversees the Motor Vehicle Division, didn't take a position for or against the bill. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Thank you, Jonathan. As always, and after this, a closer look at what the Montana Indian Child Welfare Act might mean for Montana's communities. And in a bit, Montana's congressmen react to the latest on mysterious objects in Montana's airspace. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the State. 
Welcome back. Lawmakers are considering putting the protections of the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act into Montana law. We've been following the bill in committee, but first, here's some context on what this is before we get into our story. Congress enacted ICWA in 1978 to protect Native American children from being removed from their homes to be fostered or adopted by anyone from outside the tribe. This due in part because of the history of forced removals of children and assimilation policies in the U.S. Montana's rate of American Indian children in foster care is 3.7 times as high as the rate of Caucasian children. And now the U.S. Supreme Court is expected to rule on a case challenging those protections sometime this year. Ten other states in the U.S. have already codified the federal requirements into their state laws. I talked to a mother from the Northern Cheyenne tribe and she told me how ICWA works in her life. The ICWA program falls within the Family Drug Treatment Court, a process where parents who lose their children due to addiction issues can receive treatment and get their kids back. It was work. It was like a job, putting in the hours and you know, it was so, so much work, but so worth it. Worth it, because Kyle Spang was reminded of her worth. I don't have to do these things. I get to do these things was my attitude with all of that, because I got to get my life back. I got to be the mom that I always was meant to be, you know, and the great person. I'm strong, and, you know, um, I get to dream dreams now and, you know, make goals and achieve those goals. You know. She's already achieved so much, like getting Shad back in her life, the youngest of her five kids. So that just like made me more motivated because I had this little life to take care of that was just with me. The Indian Child Welfare Act ensured that Shad was placed with Kyle's Northern Cheyenne relatives while she was receiving help. For my son to be with my family and have that cultural component is very important. Tribal advocates play an active role in the treatment and reunification process. And it's just a whole like a family engagement meeting and you get to be a part of it and all of them get to hear how your success is doing, you know, and everybody's on the same page. Kyle told me her connection to home meant so much to her recovery. Having the tribal people support me and just made me proud because that's my culture. Cultural connections lawmakers are trying to protect at the state legislature through the Montana Indian Child Welfare Act. Representative Jonathan Windyboy is sponsoring the bill. It seeks to put the protections of federal law into Montana code and add some other programs. Like child support, like Title IV e foster care and all of these other things because this ICWA thing is more than just ICWA. It has a whole different um, layer of programs that tie into this for the best interest of the child. The bill will impact families like Kyle's, where love was stronger than 20 years of addiction. So what do you hope for Shad? For Shad, I hope that, you know, um, my parenting, I get to be involved and do things and be there and nurture him and love him. I get to do with him what I never got to do with my other kids. Can I ask what this has been like for your other four kids, because you're sort of restored as their mother too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's that been like? So proud. They are so okay. proud. And, you know, not once have my kids given up on me. Kyle is set to graduate from the program in May. It'll be one of their first classes. I talked to Representative Wendy Boy further about the measure. You can listen in. Why don't we start off with, um, like you were saying a little bit before we started recording, how did we get here? What's the impetus for this legislation now? Well, back in uh, 2013, when when I was in the Senate, I uh, had a constituent that approached me about some of the difficulties, some of the challenges that uh, was posed in the court system of trying to uh, get a smoother process of trying to get reunited with uh, with some foster kids that were out of state, and so that's what I wanted to do. Basically, is to um, uh, put the Put, put the uh, this in statute so that the state courts can will recognize the federal equal law, and so you know it had a short life and it didn't make it very far, and so I just uh, left it at that until this session. What's different about this session um, that made you want to bring this up again? Does the uh, current Supreme Court case have some bearing on this? Of course, and it's unfortunate, you know, that uh, we have to address issues 
with cases such as this, you know, and uh, that was has been the the uh, whole issue with a lot of the equal cases involving Indian children. I mean, you, you go if 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 you go back and throughout the history that uh, the children and the future generations of our tribes have always been under fire, under attack. And this is and this is no different. And uh, since 2013, there has been a couple of more equa courts that have been established in Montana. There's one in Missoula and two in Billings. And so we're starting to <clears throat> this is starting to steamroll and uh, and definitely that Brackeen case out of Oklahoma that's that was already heard in the United States Supreme Court. And uh, there were oral arguments that have happened already. And as I understand that the uh, that the final ruling will probably be done in June or July of, of this year. And I think that if and that's what's important for us right now, that as we address this uh, important topic of Mikwa, that it stays front and center here in Montana, because uh, this is something that uh, has been playing out on a national level. There's roughly 10 other states in the country that uh, already have bits and pieces, if not all, of what we're trying to do here in Montana. And uh, this session, there's Wyoming and there's also Utah that are taking up similar legislation right now as, as we are. So this is a, has been a national move uh, across the country. Describe how this uh, legislation will will work and what it means for Montana's Child Protective Services. Well, right now, if you take a look at, at the bill itself, there is a lot of uh, sightings of uh, federal <clears throat> federal law, USC codes, that's already in, in place. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that it's in Montana state statute that's that's implemented here. And so the, the, the law will be recognized in all district and state courts in the state of Montana that this is what this is what's going to happen in this and what you see here in the federal law you're going to see different um, different uh, depart, uh, programs under the HHS that's going to fall into play here like child support like Title IV e foster care and all of these other things because this ICWA thing is more than just ICWA. It has a whole different um, layer of programs that tie into this for the best interest of the child, and that's what's that that's that's the point that needs to be recognized as well. Well, what is unique for some of these things here? I'll give you an example. <clears throat> that say, for example, there's a tribal enrolled. Uh, child that's living in Oregon, for example, and the, and the, the, that, that enrolled child who is enrolled in one of the tribes in Montana here, should the family here located in Montana want to pursue custody over that, <clears throat> over that uh, child that's a, um, in foster care in, in Oregon. So this, this process here is going to come into play as far as making sure that uh, the jurisdiction stuff are respected and respective in one to one another. Oregon court, uh, the Oregon courts, as well as Montana courts, and a lot of this um, interstate uh, compact stuff needs to be also it will also come into play because because of the respect of the different uh, different things and and it's it's nothing new. I mean, just in the last couple of years, for example, there has been this issue about different uh, health care. Um, being 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 allowed in other states, this is kind of similar that preceded that a long time ago since 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 this began. Okay, and this might be a okay. So clarify for me. So will the bill? So will the law? So will it give the state some sort of additional jurisdiction, or will it just put in statute that the tribes have jurisdiction? Both. Both it'll give it'll give the jurisdiction and make the process a lot easier for the tribes and their jurisdiction to to, to assume that that uh, custodial uh, for parental rights for the for for the for the um, parents or grandparents here for the family members here over those children.
I always say that whenever, whatever law that gets enacted, where the rubber meets the road is where the uh, rulemaking process starts. And if the and if the equal workers on the local reservations who don't understand that need to know that's where law becomes effective because that's where their room gets filled with a whole bunch of uh, attorneys trying to interpretate the legislative intent, all of this and that. I know that because I, I, I witnessed that 15 years ago. And so I think that it's important for, uh, for everybody that just because it gets signed into law, we need to be, we do need to be at the table to make sure that we have um, our say in that process. Welcome back to Face the State. Well, it's a political issue we didn't see coming, but everyone is talking about, including lawmakers in Helena. Mysterious flying objects crossing into North American airspace. Two out of the four objects shot down over the span of about a week floated over Montana. President Biden addressed the nation Thursday about the unidentified objects recently shot down by the U.S. military. The series of shootdowns followed a takedown earlier this month of a Chinese spy balloon that flew across Montana and was shot down off the coast of South Carolina. President Biden says the intelligence community's latest assessment is that the mystery objects shot down over U.S. and Canadian airspace, two of which were detected in Montana, most likely belong to private research or recreational companies. We don't yet know exactly what these three objects were, but nothing, nothing right now suggests they were related to China's spy balloon program or that they were surveillance vehicles from other, any other country. Montana Representative Paul Tuss, a Democrat who represents Haver, was back in the area Saturday for a community event when federal authorities briefly issued flight restrictions in the area of north central Montana. And I was at that event when our phone started to uh, pop with regard to the news that the airspace over Haver in northern Montana had been closed. So there were a lot of curious folks about what was happening. Tuss said residents he's talked to aren't afraid, but they do want more information. People don't consider themselves or their families unsafe, but particularly given the news in the last week about all the various balloons and other flying objects that seem to be uh, over the United States, um, there's just a cur curiosity about what's happening. National reports say the object reported over Haver was likely to be the one taken down over Lake Huron on Sunday. Senator John Tester on Face the Nation Sunday said the nation wants answers. But look, we, I got briefed uh, both an open session and a classified session. And, and quite honestly, uh, the, the military and intelligence community's explanation of what transpired with that balloon, I accept. Is it something that I would have done right out of the, right out of the shoot? No, I, I would have probably done it different. But that's not saying that I'm right or I'm wrong or they're right or they're wrong. In right. the end, we ended up with a balloon that they've recovered and they're going to take and put it back together and reverse engineer it. And we'll find out what they're up to. Plus the information that was gathered while it came across the United States. And following the president's briefing Thursday, I talked with Senator Steve Daines about the ongoing drama in the skies. One of the big talking points we've been hearing the last couple weeks. You have been busy along with the Montana's other delegates. We've seen you on national news talking about uh, mysterious flying objects entering Montana and North American airspace and what that means, what they are, and what our policy towards them should be. It's been a huge conversation. Well, I there's a lot of concerned Montanans who are phoning our office. I'm getting direct phone calls from county officials saying, what's going on when you see an airspace closed, an airport shut down? Remember that NORAD was founded in 1958. That was 65 years ago. That was under the Eisenhower administration. For 65 years, NORAD had never taken down an aerial object. Until the last two weeks, they've shot down four. Three over the United States and one over Canada. The President of the United States needs to be decisive and to get out in front of the American people and talk about what is going on. The weakness shown by this administration by waiting too long to act with that Chinese spy balloon that came right over our ICBMs in Montana is inexcusable. We know also, though, that the, during the previous administration, there had been three similar Chinese spy balloons that flew over the United States. Um, we just didn't see them, and we hadn't been told about that. Um, no matter who the president is, 
does there need to be a more open door policy when it comes to um, balloons or other spy objects floating in U.S. skies? Well, look, that, that, uh, that fact was spun by the White House as trying to divert attention from their problem. Uh, those balloons didn't fly right over the United States. Uh, they were over some territories and they did not fly right over the heartland of our country. The president said he will share more with Congress when the new policy rules are complete and made no apologies for taking down the Chinese spy balloon earlier this month. The violation of our sovereignty is unacceptable. We'll act to protect our country and we did. Welcome back to Face the State. Welcome back to Face the State. We have Jonathan Ambarian joining us from Helena. Jonathan, how's it going up there? Uh, fine. Thanks, Jackie. It's uh, getting to be a busy time up at the legislature. Yeah, we're in mid-February. What are some of the bills we're looking forward to in the next coming week or weeks? Well, uh, we're to the point now where we're about two weeks out from the transmittal deadline when any bill that doesn't include money in it has to pass through the first chamber and into the second chamber or it dies. And so we're going to see a ton of bill hearings over the next few days, uh, just as they're trying to get every um, one of these proposals a hearing. And you're going to see a lot of the timelines be a little shortened. And some of these things will, will have hearings and they'll try and move them quickly. Uh, and so I think that what we're going to see are a lot more of uh, things related to you know, some of the topics that we've talked about, housing being one, we've seen a lot uh, coming up about zoning, what kind of zoning cities should and shouldn't be able to have, uh, what restrictions they should be able to put on locally, and whether the state should step in and say there are types of housing that should be allowed in more places than they are right now. Uh, we're going to see a lot of bills uh, related to the judiciary, uh, how the ju uh, judges are elected in this state, uh, a lot of proposals to allow partisan endorsements or uh, or allow uh, judge candidates to to uh, name their preferred parties things like that uh, have been proposed we've seen some already and we're going to see more uh and uh we also i'm told they're going to hear some uh, abortion related bills i haven't seen a ton of them yet uh, this session but we will likely see some more um abortion related bills uh, trying to uh, establish some more restrictions uh, coming from Republicans. Uh, we've been told that they do have some planned for uh, coming up. And the, again, we're coming up on a, a deadline. So, And thank you, Jonathan. We'll keep following your work, follow that budget, those hot button issues. And we're looking forward to see what comes out of the session. And uh, we'll see you back here next week on Face the State. Thanks, Jackie.